Hello, Patricia Rati. I'm Jazz Glarty, and welcome to Occlusion Wars, episode 99 with Dr. Bobby Supple. This episode was inspired by a blog post that I saw Dr. Bobby Supple write on his website, and it was about the differences between the different occlusal camps, or these occlusal religions, hence why the name Occlusion Wars, because one of the most common questions I get is, Jazz, what should I do? Should I study with Dawson, or should I study with uh, Panky, or should I study with Kois, or Spear, and Neuromuscular? So there's a lot of these uh, occlusal religions, and that's what we call them throughout this uh, episode, you know, tongue-in-cheek kind of thing, uh, and what, which one's the best one? Which is the correct religion. That's what we're hoping to answer in this episode. And the main question I asked uh, Dr. Bobby Supple was exactly that. I don't want to give too much away from this episode, but one thing to consider is that the end goal of no matter who you train with, whether it is Spear or Panky, Kois, whoever, you will do wonderful dentistry. You will do it for the benefit of the patient. You will have more fun as a comprehensive dentist. So whoever you train with, just do everything they say and do it properly and follow that system. But don't be afraid to expose yourself to other ways of thinking. Because essentially what these um, religions, these occlusal religions argue about is the processes. How do you get from A to B? The B is the same. A is the same. A is your patient. B is a stable position, whereas a, a better smile, um, a nice comfortable bite, all those things, right? So A and the B are the same. What we're fighting about is everything in the middle. And that really doesn't matter. We should be outcome based, i.e. Uh, a longevity in our restorations, happy patients. And I think all of those occlusive religions deliver exactly that. And that's one of the sentiments that uh, Dr. Bobby Supple passed on. Uh, and I just want to echo that. Now, if you want to really uh, skip to that bit, it's probably somewhere in the middle to the end of the episode where we really get to the nitty gritty. I mean, we start off in this episode discussing the origin story. I mean, the origin story is always really powerful of these clinicians that we speak to. Uh, Dr. Bobby Supple has so much experience to share. So we learn about his origin story, but also the origin story of uh, how it goes from Nathology to then uh, Panky to then Dawson Spear and how they came about in, in the East Coast and the West Coast, the bioesthetic group, how that played into it. And eventually um, in part two, we will cover something really deep. I mean, the direction this podcast goes in is, is really thought provoking. Essentially, that the message is that we find these patients who have destroyed their dentition and we're arguing about how we're going to uh, restore this destroyed situation. So we're all arguing about how to restore the patient, whereas what Dr. Bobby Supple says that we need to think preventatively. We need to screen our children for airway issues uh, and consider the correct assessment at the right age and nasal breathing so that we can avoid those bigger issues in the future. So it's amazing how much of a tangent we go into in terms of posture, airway, which really is the biggest growth area in dentistry uh, in the next 20 years, and uh, I'm sure of that. Now, if you're new to the podcast, welcome. Thanks so much for listening. We're on episode 99, almost to 100. Wow, okay. So uh, if you're new to the podcast, then a lot of the episodes are occlusion-based. If you are new to occlusion and your knowledge of occlusion is quite basic and you haven't studied with these uh, big schools or big occlusal religions, then maybe you want to go back to episode 90, Basics of Occlusion. This is, again, for the seasoned occlusal practitioner uh, who has been to maybe a few of these occlusal schools of thought and, and just loves to learn about what the different camps have to say. So this is really made for the ultra geek when it comes to occlusion. But you can still listen and follow along. I think I'm sure you'll gain so much from it as well. The protrusive dental pearl I want to share with you for this episode is something that you guys have requested. The community, the protrusive dental community have requested this from me uh, and I've now finally delivered, okay? It's about how to give a buckle infiltration for a lower first molar. So uh, a lot of people still doing ID blocks, which is fine. I still do ID blocks, but I'm doing them way less now compared to five, six years ago when I wasn't using a buckle articane for lower first molars. So uh, pretty much the only time I'll be giving a ID block or an inferior alveolar nerve block is if I'm doing uh, an extraction of a uh, lower second molar or a wisdom tooth. Uh, most other scenarios, I'm doing infiltrations with articane. So I have a video that I posted to YouTube. I, I toyed with the idea of putting it in, in this video, but I think for the, my audio listeners, it, it just won't make sense. You want to see exactly where I insert the needle and how we do it. And again, everything that uh, I'm sharing with you guys is stuff that's been taught to me over time. I, this is nothing new. I'm just passing it on. I'm trying to make it tangible for some young dentists who haven't done buckle and successfully, or you've done it before and, and you found that the anesthesia hasn't been sufficient, I'm gonna share the secrets with you uh, through a clinical video, which my patient kindly let me record, and that's gonna go on YouTube. So if you want the protrusive dental pearl, it's how to successfully give 
lower first molar anesthesia using articaine without an inferior alveolar nerve block. Anyway, hope you enjoy that and I'll catch you in the outro. Here's quite a long and meaty uh, and geeky episode with Dr. Bobby Supple. Hope you enjoy. Dr. Bobby Supple, welcome to the Protrusive Dental Podcast. How are you? Hey, I'm well today. Thank you from the US. Thank you so much for coming on. It was uh, Thanksgiving yesterday and you had some lovely family time. We are just catching up before I hit the record button. Uh, I've been super excited. I mean, for, for the listeners that know and uh, everyone so kind of has got Got the feel for the podcast now, Protrusive Dental Podcast. The cornerstone of this podcast is is furthering ourselves in in the field of occlusion uh, and learning from from lots of different educators. Amazing, to, amazing to have you on today. Someone who's done so much recently. I've uh, I've seen a lot of your stuff on digital, uh, but I initially found out about you through a Google search. I was at one stage looking uh, for the differences between what we'll call the different occlusal religions, if you can use that term. You know, what's the difference between Dawson and Coys and Panky? and spear and you're muscular and I came across one of your articles uh, and I thought okay I've got to get this guy on uh, I've got to get Dr. Bobby on to to, to share with my listeners because this is something that uh, confuses a lot of people um, like many things do uh, outside dental school and I'm just looking for some clarity uh, to pass on I personally uh, Bobby I don't want to learn about you in terms of which religions uh, you have uh, prayed with uh, but I have uh, prayed with uh, Dawson uh, you know Ian Buckle uh, I've done uh, you know the Dawson Academy UK I've done lots with spear Academy online. Uh, I've done with my mentors uh, in my principles in the past have been Panky trained, Michael Mokers, Hap Gill. Uh, so I've got a, a bit of a background. The only people I haven't really had training with is neuromuscular. Um, so how about yourself, Bobby? Um, tell us about yourself, where you are, and what was your pathway in terms of uh, uh, the schools of thoughts when it comes to, to occlusion? Okay, that's a long story, but I'll try and make it as quick, as short as possible. <laughs> I uh, was at Tufts. I went to dental school at Tufts, and then um, I got started in preclin on my first day. My lab partner, he was a name, his name was John Samaha. His dad was actually head of prosthetics at Harvard. And John did all of his dad's uh, lab work growing up, and so I was at Thanksgiving, so that was, I don't know, but 40 years ago, almost to today. And then uh, John invited me to New Hampshire because I could, I'm from New Mexico, so I didn't go home for Thanksgiving. But anyway, I'm sitting literally after three months of dental school with the chairman of prosthetics at Harvard at his Thanksgiving table. So John learned it all from the lab. So I learned it from the lab perspective. And so then having a pre partner that knew all about occlusion and everything like that, then I got off to an awesome start. I had a tremendous, tremendous dental school experience. Uh, there was a, another prosthodontist at Harvard, uh, um, Tufts. His name was Lloyd Miller. Lloyd Miller has had a laboratory in Boston and you had to be somebody just to send your stuff to this lab. Everything had to be fully mounted. And Lloyd Miller was a good friend of Peter Dawson's. When I uh, finished dental school, I was broke and I wasn't going to really hang around in Boston too much because it was gray and cloudy. I'm from New Mexico, so I was going <laughs> back to the sunshine in the Southwest. But, but uh, Lloyd Miller, he told me, look it, you're... Well, I need you to just start at Panky. When you're ready, go to Panky. So then it was like two years later. So it was 1982. Then I started at Panky Institute. And then that just got me just off and running. Now, I have to understand that like, growing up as a kid, as a swimmer, I hit my jaw on a diving board. I broke my jaw here and here. So I had a condylar fracture. It was the surgeon and the orthodontist who put me back together who got me interested in dentistry so I had no family connections or anything with dentistry my dad was an engineer so it was I more was the artist person in the family the odd person out but what happened is simply I was just always always interested in TM so I'm at dental school, didn't learn much about my jaw, that sort of thing, but we didn't know. We didn't even have imaging. We didn't have panos. We didn't even have anything that could just like image the joints and anything like that. And so when I first went to Panky, there was a guy named Updegrave, and he had written the radiology textbook that I had studied for my board. So I walked in, he's like 70 years old, one of those pure, pure master teachers. And I go, I know you, because I had to study you. And anyway, <laughs> then I told him my little story. He sat me down. He did a transcranial, and he's kind of talking about the lateral pole. And then I literally 
I'm going, wait a second, I'm in a world that I know absolutely nothing about. So I kind of made it my life's work and then that started me on the journey. Now quickly in Panky, you just, you go through these curriculums and continuums and things like that. So I was through Panky pretty much by the, uh, through the eighties. There was a gentleman there named Parker Mahan. Parker Mahan was Peter Dawson's roommate and confidant in dental school. He ran the uh, Florida um, uh, occlusal pain management from the University of Florida, but he was this master, master teacher. So I did all of my jaw dissections with him. And then the real breakthrough started in uh, 1989. I went to, with my fiance at the time, and we went to St. Thomas Virgin Islands, and there was a week, and the week was Peter Dawson, Parker Mahan, and Mark Piper, so they called it the Peter Parker Piper Show. <laughs> that is fantastic. <laughs> it was a uh, week where you were just literally on the beach at times, back and forth, and so I got to be tremendous, tremendous friends with all three of them. And then I just, Mark Piper, he was my TM coach and Pete was my occlusion coach and Parker was medical and TM and dental and all of that sort of thing. And so, so that's where I got the whole big start. So basically I'm Pinky, born, bred, Dawson, prototype, so I understood CR or the concept of centric very, very well. And then now I'm in New Mexico starting in the 90s. And then now the occlusion war sort of started. <laughs> Dawson called it um, blood on the walls. He actually liked that. He wanted the fight. He was always up for the fight. So he actually was a prodder. And so when any time of another philosophy kind of came into the scenario, then then he wanted the debate. Okay. Excellent. But in New Mexico, I'm in a different scenario because I'm in the middle of the country. Panky Dawson Academy had not started yet. So the East Coast was definitely all centric oriented. It's just put the condyles back in the sockets, go from there. Okay. And then what happened is the, the nathology group was the very first one that I was with. Now they were actually pre Panky. The nathologists were the ones who invented the Charlie Stewart, the fully functional articulators. They were into gold and they would do the points in back and lines in the front and all of the, when you would put it on the articulator, but they were the ones who actually invented the articulator. So they were working through it. The problem with mythology is that you did all your adjustments on the articulator and everything was done in gold. So you would do gold and you'd have these buttons and then you would seat the whole case uh, Peter K. Thomas and some of these brains in the, you know, the history of dentistry. But then they would take off the little buttons, put it back on it, remount it, do all the adjustments on the articulator and come back because they actually believe the articulator was better than the mouth. So uh -huh, that's kind uh -huh. of how that part of it started. The mythology guys, they sort of went out of the way because it was way too hard, way too much work. You were always remounting, and then the whole idea is that you weren't allowed to adjust in the mouth, which turned out to be their downfall. So, so Bobby, you, you can argue that um, the nathology to practice uh, like a nathological dentist, it was um, not practical uh, and not universal. And uh, the point of entry was perhaps too high for someone who wanted to uh, be pra a pragmatic dentist. Uh, absolutely. But the concepts is what we learned in dental school. It's like point, groove, mesial buckle cusp, intermesial buckle groove, slide, all of those sort of things. So we actually learned all of the nathology concepts when we first picked up our very first articulator in dental school. All right, so the next group that kind of came around was a group called bioesthetic dentists. Bioesthetics came out of Southern California. Bob Lee was the, the general behind all of that. And then, so the, they put, Condyles and centric, they totally believe. Put them in CR. This they come back in CR, but then, then you had to add, not subtract. Okay, so they would add composite, and then it would build up, and then everything was all pointed cusp. So if you 
we're wearing down a canine on one side and oh my gosh, you have to stop. Now you've got pathology going on. So you got to build back the canine and get all the points back. And so, so their concept was to build up all the anatomy in the front. Don't let it all wear down. Okay. Now then we got into a problem with terms and words because the word equilibration at that time was under attack. So this is in the nineties when equilibration first started getting attacked. Mm -hmm. The biosetic dentist would do what you would call negative coronoplasty. So it was okay for them to adjust a tooth, but if you called it equilibration, then that was nicknamed <laughs> mutilation. And so equilibration became mutilation. And then what you were doing is you were just subtracting and everything you were just cutting down the backs in order to get to the fronts when their thinking was, no, you have negative coronoplasty, but you also have positive coronoplasty. So then by doing uh -huh. composite and adding, so... Then it was sort of the add and subtract. And to this day, I still use those concepts. I still use composites mm -hmm. and I'll build some things up in the front and, and uh, that sort of thing. Okay. Just, now, just to make the bioesthetics uh, tangible, I mean, it's essentially uh, regain anterior guidance and then fill in the spaces at the back uh, to the new vertical dimension. Is that a, um, a philosophy that uh, sums it up well? Yeah, exactly. So you can still use that. So in a sense, what they do is they put them in, I, they manipulate it, close all the way down till you get the first point of contact. Okay, so now you have your first point of contact. So Dawson calls that your anterior control. Now you have to know that the word anterior has been bastardized in dentistry because to the master dentist, anterior means anterior to the conduct. Condyle. We, mm -hmm. we think of anterior as anterior guidance, mm -hmm. but anterior guidance is the entire occlusion. We think of it and thought of it as, as canine disclusion. So all mm -hmm. of dentistry thinks, okay, well, the anterior guidance is from canine to canine. When in reality, anterior guidance is from second molar to second molar. So mm -hmm. if you close down and the condyles are seated, say young, okay, when there really isn't any kind of damage or anything, adaptation, things like that, you can put them back pretty much every... 14, 15 year olds, condyles are fine. You stick them back in the condyle sockets, close down and in. That's your first point of contact. No, that's called your anterior control. So, anterior means in front of the condyle. So, you may have a posterior teeth controlling the whole entire occlusion. Mm -hmm. That's how I got started with the T scan. So, back at Tufts, uh, so T scan came out of Tufts. I go back for my five year reunion. I'm with all of my you know, dental school teacher friends, but they were into the T-scan at that time because there was a guy named Dr. Manis who taught. So T-scan came out of Tufts. So then uh, there, one of uh, my other professors, he just goes, no, you got to look at this, Bobby. You're going to love this. You're just going to absolutely love this. And so anyway, then I became an early adopter to the T-scan. So I had a T-scan back in the 1990s. So now you're looking mm -hmm. at 30 years and gone through 30 years before me Bobby because I, I, as some of Melissa now know I've only recently just uh, uh, got my uh, T-scan I'm about four weeks uh, away from it being delivered at the time of recording so I'm super excited uh, and I've also recorded with uh, uh, Rob Kirsten it's not been published yet maybe by the time this comes out it may be uh, so we've discussed a little bit about the T-scan so my listeners know a little bit about the, the T-scan uh, research and the applications perfect perfect so I've gone through now six, seven generations. So now we're at T-Scan 10. So every four or five years, it's like your cell phone. It comes back out and things like that. And so each generation had, a, you know, an upgrade and that sort of thing. Okay. So we'll talk a little bit about that later. But the T-Scan, what I would do is I would literally look for my anterior control. So I wanted to know what was the first tooth that touched, which teeth touched, how hard they touch it, and what sequence that they touched into. So then then Dr. Dawson, he loved the T-scan. So Christensen, Gordon Christensen, loved it. So I'm in his office in Utah, and then there's his T-scan in it, and Dawson had it in his operatories. And so, you know, one time I just asked Pete about it, and, and he goes, yeah, well, we use it in the laboratory all the time. So... So Dr. Dawson's dad was a dentist. He grew up in the lab. So he had been doing his dad's work since he was six years old. So mm -hmm. anyway, in the lab, then 
what they would do is they would take the T-scan, mount the models, and then check it on the models and then go to the mouth. And so then they were using the T-scan to check the, the validity of their mountings to see if they all matched up. Well, lo and behold, mm -hmm. these things match up pretty damn good. But you kind of started to realize, no, the problem is that the mouth is a little bit more perfect than the articulator because you had flaws where you would take the impression, pour the models and then mount it and then all of that sort of thing. So we were close with mountings, but guess what? We never really ever did hit a home run when we mounted it and sent it into the lab because you always knew that as a dentist. So it would come back, but you would always have to do some kind of adjusting in the mouth, mm -hmm. even as close as and nice as the dentistry and the lab technician might be. But anyway, that, so that's the whole sort of T-scan story. So the bioesthetic guys, they actually were a bit of a problem in my community because there was a number of bioesthetic and they were anti-equilibration. Uh, so, so for a little while, it was sort of like I was under attack, but my MO was the T-scan and I would sit down in my study clubs. We were in RB Tucker Gold Study Clubs. These are my friends. I mean, I grew up with them in dentistry. We just had a different philosophy of where we were coming from, from an occlusion standpoint. Uh, can, can I just ask uh, on that regard, uh, you mentioned that uh, bioesthetics, they had this term called negative chronoplasty. Uh, just yeah. to make it extremely obvious those listening and, and watching, um, do you mean that essentially they were collaborating, but they didn't want to admit they were collaborating? Is, is, is that what you're alluding to? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Like call a spade a spade, you know? I mean, yeah, that's what yeah. So yeah, they would adjust a cusp tip, but then their concept was, well, we're never adjusting vertical. We're just adjusting like left and right lateral slides and things like mm -hmm. that, which is fine, but they were adjusting mm -hmm. nonetheless. Yeah, okay. but they're very much prescriptive in terms of. I, I believe it's um, one of the measurements they prescribe is that between the uh, gingival zenith of the upper canine to lower canine, it must be uh, 19 millimeters and whatnot. Uh, were they quite prescriptive in in, in those sorts of parameters? Exactly. Exactly. They would have it all mounted up in CR, okay? Because CR hadn't really been totally attacked back then. It really wasn't adapted centric and things that that was coming next. That was the next firestorm with because you had imaging in the joints, and then now you were starting to see changes in the joints. So, so that all fired up with the neuromuscular guys that came at the year at the turn of the century. But what happened later in the 90s is, is occlusion in the U.S. switched from what we would think of as East Coast and West Coast. So you had said Southern California, the mythology, and then East Coast was all the centric type guys. Okay, yeah, biosetics was in there, but it all moved to the Northwest part of the country. It all moved to Seattle. So at the Hank Institute, you would have Dawson Masters Week. So Pete Dawson every year would have a week, and then so I would go, but he always brought in a guest. Okay, so his guests were Cloyce and Spear, you know, they, they were the best in the <laughs> world of dentistry, Piper. So I went to two of those, but you're sitting in an entire week, and then you have Dawson and Spear in the same room for a week. Okay, but this was before Frank was famous and had gotten into it, but... But the thinking was coming all out of Seattle. Cloy Spear says ortho, how you bring ortho into it. And then they formed what was called the Seattle Study Club. Mm -hmm. So the Seattle Study Club, uh, we, we had a branch of it in New Mexico. And in every quarter, you would get a, a magazine. And the magazine would have uh, people's pictures on it and things like that. I should run and show you real quick in the, the office next door. <laughs> I got a whole stack of all these beautiful, beautiful Seattle Study Club pictures and things like that. And so, so then every single quarter, then these magazines would come out, but they, what they would do is cases. So hang on for just a second. You can talk to your audience. I'm going to go grab those. Sure. Real quick. One second. Yes, please. Yeah, yeah, that sounds good. So uh, while uh, Dr. Bobby gets uh, those uh, magazines, very amazing of him to do that. So those who, who remember, you can watch these episodes on YouTube uh, and on Facebook by post snippets on the Instagram at Protrusive Dental. Uh, and a lot of people, they like listening to the episodes as they're driving, commuting. Uh, some people, they chop onions while they listen to podcasts. We know that already. Uh, and then, of course, for those who want to watch 
watch the full experience, they catch it on YouTube. Uh, there is the app coming out soon as well, but I'll keep you updated on that. Okay, so every quarter you would get a magazine. So four times a year. So we got Cloyce, you got Spear on the cover, you got everybody. I mean, there's these are amazing. One I love after it. The other. There's <laughs> Peter, Peter Dawson. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yep. So each one of these would have a case and then there was Perio probing and then they would have it and it was, then the case was done start to finish. Oh my gosh, it was a textbook every single quarter coming in. And seriously, look at, got, yeah. So, and, and these are essentially like for these full protocol cases that are coming. Uh, and what we see now, uh, Bobby, is on on the way that learning has become a social experience now on with social media, we we see these full protocol cases um, so much. And then I, I do believe it's never been a better time to be a dentist than now. If you're hungry for knowledge, these cases, uh, great dentists are sharing their full cases, full six point pocket chartings to mountings, everything. The young dentist can learn so much. It's, it almost accelerates your learning pathway uh, compared to when you had to wait a quarter to get that magazine without one case in it. Now you can literally binge case after case after case and you can reach out to any mentor in the world oh no you're exactly right it has never ever been a better time and honestly these occlusion work they're all over we'll talk about that the second half of the, this whole thing because we're mm. now so for myself we're a decade almost two decades out in front of all of this but you got the idea so that was pre-internet the seattle study club like you said, it took a, every quarter, but I couldn't wait. I'd salivate the next time the magazine came in. Who's going to be on the cover? You know, oh, I love you. I love you. I'm so glad. I'm so glad. It all, it all was coming from the Northeast. It's all coming from Seattle. And then that's where then the Spear Institute employees, they started there. You had Cohen, one of the greatest orthodontists in the country. And, and so these guys were all in the think tank. And then if you ever heard any of them lecture, like Frank lecture, you just knew that you were in the presence of some kind of saint because the way that they would talk about vertical and then it just all made sense. So, so anyway, they were all centric guys. They were literally, they all grew up with the whole concept of CR and putting it back, but, and they knew the imaging and they would address the joints with the perio, with everything else. Now, the puzzle part that they actually did not have that came in real quickly at the turn of the century was the neuromuscular guy. So Jankelson, mm -hmm. he's out of Seattle. So, so he's into posture, airway, tongue, swallowing, breathing. Okay. Now, this is where I kind of really ended up in a situation where I was one of the few people in the country who was seeing it from all sides. So at the turn of the century... I switched my practice to, instead of prosthetics, I mean, we were into Empress and gold and everything like that, but, but I knew that every acute problem had a chronic condition, a crack and abscess and everything like that. So, so I'm going, okay, well, when does this start? Where does it start? How would a dentist then learn about occlusion from beginning to end? Because what happened is we would wait till it all broke down and then argue about how to fix it. <laughs> and then just absolutely, it was like politics. You would just blast anybody that didn't have your kind of philosophy on how to fix it. Uh -huh. Every one of the, the philosophies, religions, as Christensen called them, he called them religions. Uh -huh. right? Every one of them was, if you did it perfectly, worked. So yeah. you can't not say that they don't work. And we learned stuff from all of them. Seriously, i would learned a lot of things from the bioesthetic docs. So it was, it's not like any of these things were bad. OK, it's just that we couldn't agree. So at the turn of the century, I joined to I joined the American Equilibration Society, of which I'm going to be president in 2025. So be careful what you wish Amazing. for. Amazing. I will come to Chicago to, to your to a conference. I, I look forward to it. Amazing. I'll tell you, and it's going to be international. That's going to be the whole thing. Amazing. Yeah, so it'll be incredible. Anyway, then I also joined, at the time, what was called the American Academy of Head, Neck, and Facial Pain. So two groups, both of them said, we're the best in the world at TMD. And then I would go to each of them, each of the academies, 
And it was, you were on two different planets. You were literally not even talking the same. And a lot of the head, neck, and facial pain guys, it was started by an orthodontist named Brendan Stack. And Stack was the airway guy. Stack was the orthodontist who went, okay, the cranium is the criminal. It's all up into here. It's all about how the face grows and the mid-face cranium grows and things like that. And they were the docs that were the first ones into the airway. And these docs were not really dentists per se. They weren't clinical dentists. And just down the street was somebody who was on the board. His name was Dan Clifford. So he kind of mentored me. He was the one who got me into this group. But they did not practice clinical dentistry. They literally practiced splints, TM, posture, and things like mm -hmm. that. Okay. They were the ones that jumped in there, and then they said, okay, the condyles – do not rotate right out of the starting block symmetrically. So therefore, CR sucks. So you knew <laughs> anytime a neuromuscular dentist was on a podium, they would start off, and the first thing that they would say is, you know, there are seven definitions of centric. So therefore, we don't know what centric means, and they were the ones who literally machine gunned down CR. <laughs> they just wanted to destroy it, and they said, like, Dawson is wrong. He's like, these condyles don't rotate out of sorry, but one always will translate before the other finishes rotation and back and forth. So therefore, the concept of CR is no good. Blow it away. Jay Levy today actually wants an eighth definition of CR. He wants to add the atlas into it because we'll talk wow. about that. Okay. It's all uh -huh. We'll, we'll do this quick little demo and you'll kind of understand how posture fits into this real quickly. Uh -huh. But... And, and while we're on that, uh, Bobby, if you don't mind, just, just just going down with a small mini tangent, the definitions of CR obviously keep changing. Nothing's created more interferences than the changing definitions, the old recurring joke, obviously. But it, with the latest definition, it, it's funny how there's no mention of the disc. Right. There's no mention of the disc of being in a, in a stable position on the condyle, which a lot of people were like, well, what, what's the point of having a definition if you don't mention a healthy uh, disc to condyle relationship? So there we are. No, no, you're right. It's a theoretical position. So centric means center. And relationship means a relationship of the condyle to the fossa. So you kind of wanted to get it up into the fossa. Mm -hmm. Like Dawson would start with a bowl and take a pencil and put a pencil on the bowl and then and hold the pencil like that. And then with the bowl didn't tilt and that was called CR. So mm -hmm. so it was a theoretical relationship. Now, the problem turned out to be it wasn't the condyles in the disc itself. It turned out to be the sockets. It was the sockets that are the problem. So if you have an airway like a little deviated septum to one side or We'll get into what's called epigenetics when you have allergies, post-nasal drips, why the tongue creates this asymmetry in the cranium. So all of the asymmetry is across the mid-face. So, so if the airway is off and then one cheekbone is off center and one ear is off a little bit to the difference and you're looking at it or you'll see one eye tilt down a little bit. Anyway, what simply happens is you have cartilage-based growth. So in an infant growing, so when you're born, then you have two types of growth patterns in the cranium. So you have what's called the cartilage-based. I'm going to show you a little like picture here, if you can yeah, see. Sure. Yeah, sure. Amazing. Okay. So this is an article that we wrote. It's called epigenetics okay because mm -hmm. this is why we're in trouble and this is why dentistry is going to be the forefront of healthcare for the next couple of decades it's just like so unbelievable okay but look at there's two types of growth patterns in the skull okay so this is cartilage based so when you're born okay anything to do with airway anything to do with your nasal airway including the sphenoid bone okay because that's mm -hmm. the rod in the middle is cartilage based the mandible is cartilage based the hyoid bone is cartilage okay so they grow by cell division but that's your basic architecture inside the cranium all right so all that grows for your ability to breathe and swallow because the brain wants oxygen every few seconds. And so literally as a child, 
If you're born premature, your tongue swallow reflex isn't really mature. So in the last month in utero, that's when the, the swallow reflex is set. So literally the infant is just recirculating embryonic fluid like oil in a car. And then when you're <laughs> born, you <clears throat> gasp. Okay, so that reflex is started. Now that is the exact same reflex that you have in apnea. Close, swallow, squeeze, stop breathing, <clears throat> gasp. So you start your very first breath off of a reflex and then breathe, okay? Mm -hmm. Now any child then who can actually breathe through their nose correctly as they're growing all the way through age six. So what you have is what's called an infantile swallow. An infantile swallow is where you swallow, breathe, can breastfeed. And so between zero and six years old, before the first molar come in, your tongue is your bite splint. Your tongue is your splint. It's suckling and swallowing and everything is set. But as that child swallows in the tongue, so anything from a tongue tie to swallow back, but if that child has allergies, then you have a postnasal drip. And in the back of the tongue is not going to let anything drip into your lungs because that's pneumonia and you die. So you're basically your brain says, okay, adapt your swallow in order to facilitate your airway. And now the child isn't really breathing like this. So they're tilting like this. So that's how they sit, sleep. Okay. They're literally growing into this little bit of an asymmetry. Mm -hmm. So the sphenoid bone is twisting a little bit. So now the two sides, so the temporal bones that house the, the eminence, they literally slap right onto the sphenoid bone. Okay. Mm -hmm. So there's a little wing of the sphenoid bone, but the temporal bones attached to it. But the two temporal bones aren't symmetric. The two mm -hmm. maxillas are not symmetrical. They bone-based growth. They're not cartilage-based growth. And they're just growing to the ability for the child to breathe. So it's all about nasal airway. Well, that when Stack started in on that, I'm like so confused because I was so into jaw and bite. Jaw and bite, jaw and bite for 20 years. The whole idea that actually the Cranial architecture was the source of the problem, and then the sockets didn't grow symmetrical. They didn't grow symmetrical in shape, height, everything. They're off-center. So mm -hmm. the ball, the condyle had to grow to the socket, but the sockets aren't right, so the ball never did fit into the socket. And then the condyle heads are cartilage, but the temporal bones are not. They're hard bone. Mm -hmm. So then you've got a cartilage base growing into it, so it changes shape. So right away, the two condyles, they don't really, they're not symmetrical. No human has really a left side and a right side that are exactly, it's kind of like throwing a ball left-handed and right-handed. And it's all tied to how you close, swallow, breathe. And so then now the curve of speed, curve of Wilson, all that, it's going to grow a little bit asymmetric. All right. So now the neuromuscular guys, they were into the airway. They, they had it. The basic problem with neuromuscular as a philosophy is you had Dickerson, Dickerson and Hornbrook and Rosenthal were the best cosmetics docs at the time at the turn of the century. So we had a study club in New Mexico where we had a cosmetic study club. So, so we wanted to learn all the cosmetics when Empress came out. But what we decided as a group is, hey, instead of us flying out to California all the time, why don't we just get a mentor and we'll bring him to Mexico? So our mentor was David Hornbrook. So we get David before David was famous and then he would fly out because he loved New Mexico and Santa Fe. And there was a dozen of us and then he would come in and then you had to do the whole case, photograph it, everything like that. And then you would sit down clinically and he would be right behind you and you're doing prepping. You're prepping. Mm -hmm. So back then they called it Pack Live in California. So yeah. Pack Live was Montgomery and Hornbrook and they would bring people in. And then you were literally in the 90s learning how to prep veneers. Okay. Back then. So anyway, David was our mm -hmm. cosmetic coach. We're still good friends today. Oh my gosh, I love the guy. And uh, but anyway, he and Dickerson, they were together, but they actually got into an argument. They had different philosophies. So 
Hornbrook was more Dawson, Panky, Spear, put the condyles back into it, closed down. But then some of the Empress was breaking. So then that, that's when it all started. Oh, you better get everything lined up or you're going to crack your cosmetics. And so you needed the rear end to match the front end or you were going to get into the trouble. Today, we kind of get around some of that with the materials. We just make the materials stronger and stronger. <laughs> we don't crack things as much. But back in the day, it was all literally glass. But the materials were changing and they were beautiful and there, there was no turning back. Once you did a couple of Empress crowns on the front, you were never doing a PVC. So mm -hmm. all that sort of started, stopped with me at the turn of the century. We didn't. We were off and running with the new materials, but they were breaking. No question. In my practice, they were breaking. So, so it's like, okay, how do we get around all of this sort of thing? All right. So, so at, at that time, when you were um, using these, uh, what, what, what were at the time, novel restorations, uh, yeah. and you were uh, falling in love with the beauty of them and uh, applying them from, based on what you'd learned from the courses, but they were coming back uh, and they were breaking. This was despite you uh, putting your knowledge and experience and expertise into putting it, uh, setting it up, mounting it in, in what you felt was the most appropriate occlusion, uh, uh, most appropriate force management for that patient. Exactly. And I would have the back somewhat equilibrated and taken care of. So... So literally, I had the rear end. I had the condyles in the rear teeth, and I knew on the T-scan I had them balanced, okay? And then you would do it across the front, and sometimes then you would have the gingival, so you would use little lasers and line it all up and everything. But basically what we were doing is we were manufacturing this front to look better for the cosmetics so that when you mm -hmm. smile, like your lip posture and everything like that. So then you have these just flat-out gorgeous smiles, okay, but... It would only be a year or two, somewhere down the road, and then a lateral would crack right on a corner. And it was almost always a lateral coming around. Sometimes a can, sometimes it was a central in the middle and stuff like that. But some of them were catastrophic in that it cracked the whole veneer, and then you had to go back in, and then it went to a crown instead of a veneer. But you would literally spend a number of years with these, what you thought were beautiful, perfect cases, everything lined up, and I'm kind of doing it like the Spear guys and stuff, or the Seattle Study Club guys, you know. And sometimes you finish a case and you're just like, oh man, I'm hot stuff. Look at this and look at this. And then, <laughs> and then the reality check and they come back. But, but I put every single patient on the T-scan when they come in for their cleanings and profies and things like that. So again, at the turn of the century, I... It was about 2003 or four. I get a call from the CEO of Hexcan in Boston. He goes, hey, um, you order more sensors than anybody in the world. Uh, what are you doing? So <laughs> then they started sending software engineers through the practice and then chiropractors and then these neurologist guys who were interested in the neural network back in the day. They all would just come through my office. They were literally shadowing and stuff like that. Now, it was a little bit of a hassle for me, but I loved it because I was learning stuff that I'm going like, whoa. But I was starting to get this concept around 2005 that it's not really jaw teeth. What we do in dentistry, the way we do dentistry, the way we were taught, MIP, all that sort of stuff, it's awesome. It's, it's what we do. It's what 90% of all the dentists around the world do. It works. It's, it's how dentistry should be done, okay? The only thing with the philosophies is, okay, if it's breaking down and you want to restore it all the way back to a perfect system, then that's when the philosophies jumped in and started arguing with each other and that sort of thing, okay? So you could still, even after the cases, even if they broke, you could still do a little bit of adjusting, so a lot of it was a, in protrusive. The person would slide forward, but a canine would hit the lateral on this side, but a canine would hit a canine on the other side. So you always had these little asymmetries. And then it was pretty obvious that, okay, wait a second. The architecture of the bones is where the issue is. And the argument always in occlusion with the orthodontist, the orthodontist would go, it's a class one occlusion. Well, class one to them meant the mesial buccal cusp of the first molar hit the mesial buccal groove of the lower. And if those lined up, it was all good and everything else didn't matter, even if you were taking out teeth and all of that. 
But no, it has to do with the bones. Mm -hmm. And so we think a class one, like a teeth, and orthodontics thought it, and they were just ramming it down dentistry's throat. No, class one means that you have the teeth in the right position, when in reality, it's the bones were never, ever in the right position coming out of mm -hmm. it. So, so you have class one. So we think of it as class one, class two, class three, skeletal relationships. That's how we're mm -hmm. taught. Okay. Mm -hmm. But you could retrofit a tooth into class one in a basically a class two skeletal thing. And now what happens is you had all this power here. So the teeth were just in the way of the bones and then cracks and all of that sort of thing. And then it really wasn't until about 2010 where orthodontics now got the memo. So the younger orthodontists <laughs> coming out of school, they're brilliant. They're like, they get it. They grew up digital. They understand digital. They're not in the old concepts. They're not doing retrofit extraction, orthos, anything like and, that. And obviously imaging has helped so, so greatly uh, with our understanding. Yeah, um, yeah it's, it's all over now. I still in my community have a couple old time orthodontists, but they were a pain in my ass for decades because they were literally <laughs> like, no, this is it. This is the highway. You're just a general dentist. I'm a god. And so they wouldn't they couldn't switch and change, but they never, ever learned it correctly from a joint situation. They never put it. So these. These ortho cases would come back and they'd be 15, 16 years old. I would put them on the T-scan, have them closed down and go, oh, my gosh, this thing's not even we're close to being in some kind of harmony where the envelope of function on one side is equal to the envelope of function on the other. So then we started putting all the kids on the T-scan. I put them when they were six years old, 10 years old, 12, pre-ortho, post-ortho, and quickly figured out. It takes about age eight, nine, ten, somewhere in that. Girls a little sooner than the guys. So when the girls hit their hormones and they're starting to grow. So, so what happens is age six, the first molars come in. Seven and eight, the anterior start to come in. The lip posture should start to seal. And then at about age 12, when the bis and the canine are set, then you have your what I call your adult envelope of function. So your adult T-scan pattern is set at age 12. Mm -hmm. Pretty much routine, okay? So it's kind of like if you think of it like if you had one leg shorter than another, you can step fine, but it's the push-off where the problem is. So everything mm -hmm. is fine, symmetrical. You go to step, okay? So think of closing. Everybody can close. You can close fine. That's MIP, right? You're like there. Mm -hmm. Okay, but the push off is where the problem is and that's where the T-scan is just invaluable. Now mm -hmm. the scanners, the scanners will show the force map before and then you do like Invisalign or something like that and then it shows you the force mapping afterwards. So, so the scanners are gonna teach dentistry about balance force. Because the computer is doing it. It's just that the dentists don't know exactly what it's doing because they don't understand the dynamics of the, the trays moving and why teeth line up and then why things are better balanced. But that's the future of ortho. Or you, they're going to have a lot of trays and things like that into it. Mm -hmm. For kids, it's all about the airway. You, if, if they're jammed up and they have that what's called – their infantile swallow should actually break at age seven and eight. So at seven years old, okay, anterior teeth start to come in, lips should seal, tongue should seal, child should breathe through their nose, okay? If that doesn't happen and they don't breathe through their nose, close swallow, squeeze, gasp, lips roll, side up like that. They'll have a little dark eye right here because blood's trying to get into the nasal lacrimal duct and the veins fill up and then the child has a dark eye and you'll quickly see where they're starting to grow off center. Now think of this as literally, it wasn't just five generations ago, pretty much everybody in the world had room for all 32 teeth. Okay? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now in our country and all culture, when anytime we came in industrialized, then literally you're looking at maybe one or two out of 100 skulls where the child has room for all 32 teeth. So now that's just in five generations, 
Okay, mm-hmm. so now mm-hmm. all of that sort of evolution, what's happening is we're insulting the system so much with inflammation and nutrition and inside and being. So kind of life expectancy is about 80% where you're born and who you're born to. Mm-hmm. The other 20% has to do with your environment that you're living in and working into and stuff like that. But what happens in epigenetics is your grandparents could have been heavy smokers. And so you have a recessive gene. It's not your genetic gene. It's your epigenetic gene where now you are totally prone to inflammation. And so inflammation is now the problem in the future. Okay. All right. I'll stop there. You catch up, catch me up in, in where we want to go because I can still Yeah, do- I mean, that, 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 all the things you're saying about um, airway are so important. In my own journey uh, in airway and TMD, um, I think you, you I've, I've spoken about this in a podcast before where in the UK, we are a little bit behind. I look at US and I look at Australia as, as doing a lot of good work, groundbreaking work in terms of yeah. furthering uh, our knowledge in dentistry about this. Uh, so only in the UK, we just, we're starting to catch up. We're about 15, 20 years behind. Uh, and even in my own son, when I look at him, I'm like, is he, is he, is he nasal breathing or is he mouth breathing? I'm like very uh, picky. And now then I'm applying that to my patients and I'm, we're having those daily conversations with children, mothers, and then on adult patients screening for airway. So that's that's huge. And uh, I love your explanations of epigenetics. I think that was so needed. And, and I like how you evolved from, okay, these were schools of thoughts. We're all fighting about teeth and jaws, but really the problem is, um, is a higher level up. It's a basal issue. It's a skeletal issue, which therefore affects the, the entire chewing system. Just so that I can uh, give those answers that I promised to the community. I think you said that when it comes to the spear, uh, spear group, uh, Coyce uh, and, and Dawson, well, I think what you're trying to say is really they're not too different. They're just arguing a little bit about slightly different ways to fix the, the problem. Uh, would you say there's any more uh, nuances or, or differences that uh, perhaps we didn't go into that is that are worth mentioning between those uh, religions? So as it kind of turned out, then they were all the same except for neuromuscular. Neuromuscular was the odd one out. OK, so I was kind of getting into that because of of Dickerson and Hornbrook. So they broke apart and then, so, and they differed over basically condyle position, okay? Now, if you're neuromuscular, so if you tense the jaw, so you literally put tens units on it, okay? And then you turn it on for like 10, 15 minutes. Oh, 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 oh. (laughs) So we used to do a mile monitor. I used to do that, do a mile monitor in the 80s. And then that's how I would set my bite split. Literally, I just like pulse it. Okay. And then- Like a Jenkinson's orthotic appliance. Right. The jaw would just kind of hang open. Okay. And then I go, all right. So then just took that relationship. And then when I went to adjust the splint, I had less adjustments to do. And it's like, okay. And then the patients, their headaches went away and things like that. I didn't really understand. I always thought it was these muscles that were doing the issue. I didn't understand it was the head and neck posture, which we'll just get into in just the next step here. Okay. Mm -hmm, But, mm -hmm. But what happened is, is the neuromuscular, they would tense it and then the jaw would hang open. Okay, so it opens literally after you tense it, you vertical opens about three millimeters on the average and forward about a millimeter and to the side, left or right about a millimeter. Okay, so it's a pretty standard. You pulse them all out. Pretty okay, predictable. The mandible falls into position. Why? Because you pulled the condyles out of the socket, so they just drop down and now they're kind of hanging open. So Now what they go is now the neuromuscular says, okay, well, now we can rotate out of the starting block. You're not jammed up. So one isn't turning to rotate Mm -hmm. to get to the other level. Well, as it turns out, it was the temporal bones that were up. So one side had to drop like one leg shorter than another in order to get to that position. But open three millimeters, forward one, off to the side one. And now that's pretty much a neuromuscular bite, left side or right side. Okay. And so then what they would do is then they say, okay, well then putty. So you're hanging open. You tense for for 20, 30 minutes. Your jaw is just in rest position, hanging open. And then hurry up, get some scoop, go in there, take that registration. And then they would build a lower orthotic. Awesome thinking, okay. Lower orthotic. They would actually, the neuromuscular guys use the T-scan way more than anybody else. 
Oh, it was crazy. They were using the T-scan, but to balance their orthotics. So then mm -hmm. they would make a lower splint and then they would hold it in the vertical and let the patient chew. But then the thinking was, okay, that's where the teeth need to go. So now mm -hmm. everything's a full mouth reconstruction. Everything needs 32 crowns, which is the, what the computer says. <laughs> okay, so you do the full mouth reconstruction, all right, but then a year or two later, okay, they're not cracking the front. So with the CR guys, we would line it all up, we would set it, and then our protrusive and sliding was always a little bit like this away or that away or a little bit stressed, okay? Yeah. You're muscularly, you line up everything in the back, okay? And then the condyles are literally out of the socket. So now they're coming down, okay, all right, front teeth are fine, but you open the vertical, okay, so now what happens in a neuromuscular case is a condyle, one of them wants to seat, so one of them wants to go back, well, now you start cracking back teeth, so the neuromuscular mm -hmm. would just crack the back ones and the back ones and the back ones, and they would just go like dominoes, you know, <laughs> and then that got into a bunch of lawsuits because the... They were, these were $50,000 cases at a minimum to start with. Gorgeous, beautiful, beautiful smiles. I mean, everything was just like absolutely, but they couldn't function correctly. Mm -hmm. You actually have that same problem now with all on four cases when you're doing these uh, implant cases and we're building them in zirconium. And in the zirconium, the teeth are so hard, but you, you retrofit it all in sort of a quick fast time and you really haven't planned out everything. And so now the teeth are so hard that there is no give anywhere else. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. a lot of these cases, they're going into neurologic overload and then they're literally in pain. So mm -hmm. there's a percentage of these all zirconium cases that are throwing the patients into these neurological overloads that are landing in the... Something the has to give in the system, and that sometimes is the, the patient's uh, chewing system. Exactly. Sometimes you want the teeth to crack. I mean, if, <laughs> if you think about it, before we ever started doing crown and bridge, all you would do is chew out all the uppers and all the lower posteriors. And so I, when I was first starting, I'd see patients, I'd make a denture, and all they had was lower six teeth. That was it. Because everything else, they broke apart, trying to find neutral just by retrofitting. And mm -hmm. then we just took out all the teeth. But, but honestly, it's only been 50 years that we're actually saving the teeth. Okay, so mm -hmm. dentistry mm -hmm. is still young in, in that scenario. Well, there we have it, guys. Dr. Bobby Supple, part one. Okay. Now, the next episode, we're going to go a little bit different. Uh, it's going to be the Pascal Manier at BACD. Episode 100 is a, is a homage to Pascal Manier. Uh, it is my experience of flying to Edinburgh and everything that happened. It's like a, a slightly different, quirky, uh, fun episode, slightly different to what we usually do. Like, I'm there. I'm, I've got my sort of camera and microphone. I'm speaking to other dentists at the conference. And uh, me and Ricky have a little like chat um, at, at the conference itself to share some of the lessons that we learned from Pascal Manier and we pass them on to you. So do check out episode 100 and then we'll rejoin Dr. Bobby Supple for part two. And we really go deeper into posture, airway, uh, assessment, um, the role of what we call myofunctional therapy and all those things in comprehensive dentistry. So it does take a, a couple of tangents, but I think it's important because what he, what Bobby Supple uh, argues and he suggests and he really convinced me as well is that there's so much more to it than uh, the, the occlusion at a tooth level. We need to look higher up. We need to look at the skeletal and airway. And that really is the future uh, about how dental and medical will talk to each other so much more. Uh, and the future is looking bright. You know, the, the innovation is looking great. So that's exactly what the next episode is about. Uh, it's a bigger picture stuff. So I hope you join me for that as well. Anyway, uh, I'll let you have a fantastic day, whatever you're doing. Thanks so much for listening. As always, if you enjoyed these episodes do consider leaving a review on apple if you listen on apple please do consider leaving a review it's how the podcast grows thanks so much and i'll catch you in episode 100